when you can't obey my orders, like when you can't stop talking, what really used to irritate me, they try to slant their testimony to outrage me and upset me. Some dude wrote, Molly sucks inward on her car. Oh. And the prosecutor kept saying it over and over again to outrage me. And I finally say, counsel approach. Well, I'll say it again. We heard it the first time. You don't have to keep saying it. Everybody wants to pull in every wrong that everybody did. And I understand it to an extent, but you got to understand marriage is about love. Divorce is about business. And you got to conduct business in here with me. It is my pleasure to welcome my friend, Judge Toller, back to Negotiate Your Best Life. She is one of your favorite guests, one of my favorite guests. And of course, we all know her as one of the most popular judges on Divorce Court. And we also know that she was, she went to Harvard, she went to Penn, she is, oh my gosh, I mean, she, she did so many amazing things. She's been on Larry King, Dr. Drew. She was on so many different television shows. I, I What show are you doing right now? You just told me you were working on a brand new show. A brand new show. It's, a, it's, a, it's my first scripted show called Judge Me Not, about a young Black female judge who became judge at 33, which is what I did. And then from there, I kind of took off with a, a whole lot of license. But I'm getting ready to do, uh, we're hopefully rocking on getting ready to do season two. So we'll, you know, keep my fingers crossed. Oh, exciting. So exciting. There's a marriage boot camp. She's been on all kinds of wonderful shows. And so, but today we are going to be talking about All Rise, which is how you can transform high conflict into transformation. And I'm so excited about this topic because she definitely knows all about that and how you can get those high conflict personalities into doing what you want and then also transforming yourself. So welcome back, Judge Thank Taylor. you. It's good to be here. Thank you. So let's talk today about, first of all, those high conflict situations in the courtroom. And I, you have a focus on empowering individuals and, and being empathetic. And you, I mean, you've had a background yourself in dealing with that and you've been very um open and vulnerable in your in, in your life and how you've had to deal with them so could you share a little bit well first of all share a little bit about your own experience with high conflict individuals for people who don't know okay well i i was born i i was raised in a high conflict house my father was uh, bipolar and unmedicated and uh, you know he was a force to be reckoned with he was a wonderful man. And I, and I have to say that because just because you're mentally ill and are not able to always control your actions in a manner which you would prefer to do does not mean you're a bad person. It means you're dealing with something. And I think my mother, who I always claimed was an emotional genius, had the ability to manage him and everybody else I saw with such a plum. And she would tell me why she could do that. And anytime I was on the bench, I was on a municipal bench. So it was domestic violence, negligent homicide, fights, assaults, neighbors not getting along, all that kind of stuff. And whenever I said something on the bench where a defendant would say, huh, I see you or I hear you. It's something that my mother told me about how people feel and how that determines what they do and that the, the logic and the reasoning comes, comes far later. And if you look at it like that, if you can manage your own emotions, so you don't, so they don't dictate where your head is, and then you can figure out where their head is, then you can manage them because it's not about what they're saying so much as the feelings behind it. Mm. Why are they saying that? And she taught me one of the 
the easiest things that I taught, she taught me, especially when I was fighting with my husband, is that you start where the other person is and you slowly walk them home. In other words, I have to say to you, I know you were upset about Friday and I know why you were upset. That, that was a pain doing all of that. And, that. and I get that and I get why you yelled at me. But let me, let's, let's, let me put it this way. What if we next time, and in doing that, I've avoided an argument. I've stated my position about what he did and um, he's gonna think about it next time. And it's not gonna think about, he won't think it of it as an argument he's lost. He'll think of it as an agreement that we came to. And you can do that, not with everybody, but if you try to do that, you will be successful more often. Ooh, okay. I mean, we're only 60 seconds into this and she's already dropping gold here. Did you guys just catch that? <laughs> I mean, amazing, amazing. So I just want to break down what you just did there. Because I talk about this so often. And what I tell people to do is I tell people to put an invisible boundary down around themselves. And also then I say, step one, don't run. And take a look at the person as if you are observing their behavior to them. Because you're not in it. Yes. Yes. And so that is what you just did. And you also maintained your cool. And, and you really got like how the world is occurring for them. Right. Right. And so, right. yeah. So I just wanted to break that down a little bit more. Like how is the world occurring for that person? Right. And you can't accurately determine how the world is occurring that from that person if you're looking through at it from your perspective. So the first fight you have in any conflict with anybody is always with yourself. You have to say, I have to remove my needs, my wants, my how I want this to go from the situation so I can be an objective observer long enough to understand their feelings in the circumstance. And then I can address that as opposed to simply say, you know, you said A, I said Z. No, no, no. Let's go both walk to N and see what we can find there. And then we can go to A or Z together. Right. Observe, don't absorb. Right. Is, is another thing that I say a lot. And the yeah. other thing is you have to remove your expectations. Because there's a lot of times the the gap between what you expect and what happens is really that, that rub that that's where that friction takes place. You expect them to behave in a certain way, way. you would behave. Right. And, 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 and they're different and they're different experiences. And also if you anticipate too long, you're going to anticipate because we're always defending ourselves before we do anything else. So when you're talking to someone, you're going to anticipate the problems. You're going to anticipate the negativity. You're going to anticipate the trouble and things I'm going to have to do to get past that trouble. So you're coming into the uh, the situation agitated about something that may not be the problem. And I, my husband used to say this to me all the time. Don't fight until you know you're in one. I'm always anticipating, oh, this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem. And so you set up circumstances in your head. These are all the ways that can go wrong. So you go into the conversation trying to, to keep it going from going wrong in all the ways that you imagine, as opposed to sitting in the room with a, B, or C, and realize, oh, he just wants A. I can do that, and he'll give me B, and we're cool. So you don't anticipate. You you calm. Hmm, I like that. Don't fight until you know you're in one. I like that. And and you know, I I often say, focus on what's so, what's so. So focus on the facts. 
And I always say, like, if you're going to what if yourself, what if yourself to good things? Right. <laughs> right. But naturally, our brains do not do that because no. we're all descended from the guy who ran from the tiger, not the one who went over there and said, hey, let me see if I can pet it. So our fear system is always scanning everything. The lion was to come in there. You wouldn't have to think about it. I wouldn't see it. You'd be gone. And so our brain even uh, takes uh, anger and upset as a, as a threat to your personhood. And you can respond with the same inappropriate, fearful. I saw someone today said there are two emotions, uh, love and fear. Yes. And, and if you can live in fear and you can, if you can live in love and you can fight your fear, everybody's going to feel better. And uh, we are living in like extraordinary, well, I don't know, we're always extraordinarily fearful. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on another tangent. All I just was saying was, you know, don't let the propensity of the, of the mind to head towards problems put you in a position when you're anticipating trouble that does not exist. Yes. Oh, so good. I mean, I think a lot of times we, especially when we're dealing with a high conflict personality, we're so on edge mm -hmm. and we expect them to be in high conflict that, you know, we're just thinking, oh, they're, they're, they're you know, they're going to be high conflict. They're going to be bad. They're going to be, it's going to be awful. It's going to be, it's Right. And, and, and that's what, and then that's what you're going to get. And then boom. But you know, I play games with myself. Like if I know I'm going to go into something with somebody high conflict afterwards, I have a reward if I don't curse. And if I don't yell, and if I don't, and if I don't do any of those things, you know, I can go outside with outside with wine and double stuff, Oreo cookies and listen to music for an hour. I'm not supposed to be drinking wine and eating double stuff Oreo cookies, but that's my reward. And I will strive for things. So I keep my mind on that and I'm saying, I'm going to be cool. And then it goes better. Yeah. Because usually high conflict people, part of what they like to do is upset you. So when you don't get upset, it confuses them a little. Like, what's she doing? You know, my mother, like, if you're, you couldn't if you're insult calm my mother. And cool. And they're like, wait a minute. I can usually bait them. I can usually get them. And they're not, they're not taking it. What's going on? I had this great story about my mother. My mother and I were at dinner or lunch or something with a girlfriend of hers. And uh, I had just graduated from Penn Law. And she said, you went to Harvard undergrad, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I did. And she said, well, how come you couldn't get into Harvard Law? Oh, okay. And my mother said, you better tell us, Sally. I'll tell you why she didn't get into Harvard Law. She went to Harvard and goofed around and played. She didn't study. She didn't go to class, all of which was true. And she got into the school because she takes really good LSATs. And UPenn was, was hell on LSATs for getting in during that period of time. And that woman just deflated because she was trying to insult my mother by saying, you know, oh, you're, you're not a double Harvard. You had your Harvard and Penn and Penn is a very good school. She didn't know that. And that's okay too. But um, if you, you take the sting out of it, you don't get insulted. You had fun. And it, it, it made her, you know, my mother thanked her for saying that. Yeah. You know, I always say never Jade, which is, I, I always say I'm half Chinese. So I always wear Jade. My middle name is Yukong, which is Jade and Health. I always say, but never Jade, never justify, argue, defend, or explain. Because have you ever heard of a narcissist after you've like, you know, made a, a bunch of points go, oh my God, I totally see your side now. I've completely. Oh, never happened. <laughs> never. Even with regular, you know, you don't have to be a narcissist not to be. I mean, people remain unmoved. I saw this fascinating documentary on people who are in cults. And when like what, when the cult leader says the world's going to end Tuesday and come Wednesday, they're still there. You get invested in whatever your position is. So 
the truth can 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 smack you in the mouth and you still not see it because you're dedicated to the proposition of being invested in this cause. So that's with regular folk. So with a narcissist, are you kidding? They never yeah. say oops. Right. No. So never justify, argue, defend, or explain. Never jade. I love that. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I will always, I will, I will always acknowledge where I got it from, but that that's is right. Great. I always say I love Jade, but never Jade. <laughs> I think that's outstanding. <laughs> yes. So I, uh, can you share one of your most memorable high conflict situations in the courtroom and how it became maybe a learning opportunity for somebody. It was Mr. S. I remember his name, but I'm not going to say it. It was very long. I remember it like it was yesterday. I lived in an area that had a, a large Orthodox Jewish uh, community. And they had a lot of small shoals where they would get together and pray. This one man, Mr. S, went to this shoal, this particular shoal, and found it not to be appropriate. He thought their vision or view of Judaism was incorrect. So he went on a campaign of terrorizing them. Uh, you know, he'd stand out the door and stare everybody down. He would come in and cause a commotion. And, you know, at first I came in trying to counsel them. And within a minute and a half, I said, oh, I see what's happening. This won't work. And then one of the members of the show looked at me and said, it took us six months to figure that out. I said, he, just, he didn't care. It was, had nothing to do with what was happening in there. It had to do with, he just needed to be right. Mm. And he couldn't get off it. And it, it wasn't a matter of negotiating it. It was a matter of restricting his ability to get to them with the, uh, the promise of jail if he failed to do so. Because yeah. he was just, there was, no, and they were like, it's been going on for months. And I had him in court on and off for months because he kept getting real close to the line. You know, he'd stand across the street and stare, blah, 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 blah. But uh, order after order after order, and I finally crafted one that kept him away enough, and I put him on like five years probation so that they could go pray in peace because it had nothing to do. There was nothing to negotiate. I said, why don't you just go to another shoal? I mean, they're, you know, they're everywhere, not everywhere, but you know, but it was, there was something wrong and he needed to be right. And that was, this is where he, that's where he hung his hat. It was bizarre. But it was fascinating. But why he would want to keep coming back and seeing you. I mean, you know. Just like, couldn't. He could not. He knew he was right. He felt convicted about it. And uh, I had rabbis come in. I mean, I pulled out all the stops, but my man was not interested. And so I figured out what he was interested in, which is was being right. And I said, well we can't negotiate a piece, but I, but I can, I can keep you away from them. And I, and it worked after a year, but it took a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I, you know, it's obvious for me, I'm trying to think about, you know, I talk about how narcissists have what they call diamond level supply, which is their image. And then coal level supply, which is manipulating people. Right. I love your metaphors, by the way. <laughs> they're all really good. I mean, they're, they're really, the image just is, is so crisp and clear, but go ahead. But, you know, like, I'm just trying to think, what is that guy's diamond level supply? It's like, I guess, you know, like, I, I, they, you, it, just even getting attention from you, I mean, or, or he was in command. He brought, he had all of those people in the room. He had all, you know, the people from the soul game, you know, so that was empowering to him. Yeah. But that's the coal level supply jerking all those people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure that out with him. 
It's just, I don't know. I, I have and no sometimes idea. you don't know. You just have to figure out. Another judge friend told me, said, don't never spend time trying to figure out what people, yeah. why people do what they do. Yeah. Just I don't how know. They I'm to figure out what that guy's diamond level supply was. But and yeah. act accordingly. <clears throat> yeah. But anyway, I, you know, I had a, a situation once I called the $2 million apology where it was a mediation and mm -hmm. I'm representing the husband and he was getting ready to have to pay alimony. I mean, the wife was getting a lot of other assets, obviously, but the alimony that he was going to have to pay over the next couple of years was going to add up to about $2 million. And at the end of the night, as we're about ready to sign the agreement, the mediator comes to me and says, hey, Rebecca, can you come out here for a second? We're, and he pulls me out into the, the reception area. And he says, I have this odd request from the wife. She's willing to waive alimony if he will go over there and apologize for how he treated her during the marriage. Wow. And it was like monthly alimony. I think it was like 15000 a month or something. And, and I was like, what's the catch? And he's <laughs> like, no catch. She just wants an apology. And I'm like, okay. So I go over there and he's like, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, he wanted to be able to continue to jerk her around, be in her life, not let her go, tell everybody he's paying alimony, you know, the whole thing. She wanted an apology and wanted to be done with him. Right, right. And be done. Yeah. And so... He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to do it. And I'm like thinking, okay, I'm going to have to write a CYA letter, all this stuff, because I know, right? <laughs> they come back at me and I'm like, I'm going to kick this guy's butt. Like, you're going over there. And so I made him go. Good for you. Yeah. So he's like shuffling his feet, whatever. He's this big time developer. So he finally goes over there and does it. And, and, you know, afterwards, he actually thanks me in the parking lot for making him do it. But, you know, he did not want to do it. Right. People see a win as something. And they see, especially I found, uh, you know, there's a competition with dudes. I, I could lose the fight with my husband and get what I wanted as long as I lost the fight. You know what I mean? And and it's and it's not strictly a male thing, but what we what I fight for what I want and he fights for what he want wants. And sometimes you never realize that what you're fighting for or what you want isn't really what you need. It's just the designated target. And he realized that beating her, which was what he, you know, that was his goal. He was beating her by saying a an apology, but he had to look at it differently. You know what I mean? You got to fight the right fight. Yeah. Well, I think he thought that she was beating him. Right. By... And he can't have that. He has to win. It was like win yes. or lose. Yes or no. And yes. some people, men and women, have a hard time doing that. Right. And it's it's uh, especially now. Everyone is so dedicated to their position that to compromise is almost heretical. You know, I'm outraged. I want you to know I'm outraged. I want you to know how outraged I am. And not only that, I need you to be as outraged as I am, or I will be outraged with you. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, you're either for me or against me. Against me. There's no nuance. There's no, right. there's no gray ground. Everything's mannequin. Yes or no. Right. And it's if you're against like me, if you're against me, then you're public enemy number one. And I have to hate you. And I have to hate you. I have to hate you. Right. And that's how it goes with with these cases. That's for sure. That's for sure.
So, I mean, and this is the same guy, that guy who, you know, was like pontificating about how much money he had and how much power he had and how he could have any attorney he wanted when he hired me and how lucky I was that he was hiring me and all this stuff, you know, at the beginning. And, and then he went to try to like negotiate my retainer. And I was like, no. I said, I'm just saying. You knew how much trouble he was going to be. <laughs> and then I was like, no way I'm not negotiating. But if you would like to find somebody less expensive, I was oh, yeah. happy to give you names. And I remember at the end of the night, he said I, that he was glad that I hadn't negotiated my retainer because then he would have thought that I was going to be weak negotiating on his behalf. So there you go. Was it a test? You think it was a, an overt test or did? I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. I don't think so. I just think that that was just, you just know, him. he was yeah. a narcissist. That's what I think. I don't think I knew that at the time because I didn't know that type of behavior at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, right now right. I do. Now you do. Yeah. You've seen it enough. Yes. Yes. So what strategies would you recommend for people are most effective for managing their own emotions, first of all, and then most effective for managing emotions of others, I would say. I'm a fan of the, the initial pause. You know how you're there yet? Yeah. Count 10. I believe in that. You have to pause. And when you pause, you have to ask yourself the right questions. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? Is this feeling what I need to get me what I want? And if it's not, which one do I need to replace it with? Mm -hmm. And in that pause, I have to go through all four of those things before I can speak. So usually by that time, somebody's on the other end of the phone saying, Lynn, you there? Said, yeah, I'm here. Hang on. Because I wouldn't, because people, you know, they, and I'm like that in court, I'm that direct and fast and this and that. But if you if if I'm bothered, I have to ask myself those questions first so I don't come in a manner that's incorrect. Mm. You know what I mean? I always say it's the first you're gonna regret. <laughs> and it's and it's how am I feeling? Not what do I want. It's how am I feeling and why am I feeling that way? Because what they want may be fine with me, but since he's a person or she's a person that I don't get along with, my brain will say, well, you don't want to do what that person wants because you and that per you don't agree with that person more often than not. But you got to ask yourself. I mean, Eric and I both avoided a lot of arguments simply waiting to see why it is we objected to what the other was doing initially. And we realized, well, it wasn't even important. Mm, it's so good. So good. Uh, are, are there any strategies that, that you would recommend for people if they're dealing with somebody in the courtroom, especially or in litigation? Well, you know, what I do for entertainment is watch court cases on YouTube. I mean, actual court cases that they do for entertainment. I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. And Zoom court is hilarious because they don't really, they don't feel the immediacy of an, a bailiff right there that could send him to jail. So people just behave bizarrely. Uh, you got to lay down the rules early and in the beginning, especially when you have somebody that's pro se. So you understand, and listen, this is how it's going to go. You're going to feel like, you know, but I got to get all of this out before I go there. So don't interrupt and tell them what, you know, understand what you're doing and what you're dealing with, especially, you know, if they're pro se. When they're lawyers, there shouldn't be too much of a problem because the lawyers are obligated to take care of their clients. And if their client's acting a fool, I can look at you and say, you know, Ms. Zong, please, you know, get him straight. But if they're pro se, they're scared. They're in an environment that they're not used to. And they're usually dealing with something that's horrifying, uh, child support, custody, whatever they're dealing with. So you're meeting them at their lowest point. So you explain things to them and you find some way or another 
to make everybody laugh. I, 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 I know how you fit. Don't, now don't get started. What, we, we, anything to just like break it. And when you make people laugh, you, you get an extra couple of seconds with them whenever you talk, because I'm, I'm the chick that made you laugh. I made you, I took your cortisol levels down. Mm-hmm. I took down your, I, I took your levels down. So mm-hmm. you were more open to communicating with me. Mm-hmm. And then I watch people, how they feel. And I tell them, I said, you know, if you act a fool in here with me, you can't tell me you don't act a fool out there. You know, so remember, you're trying to get me to believe you. If you can't control yourself in here and you tell me they can't control themselves out there, I'm not going to believe that. Mm-hmm. And you started off right. And you sm- I smile a lot because uh, it's a place where people don't smile. Yeah. And I just, I, I, what I'm doing is talking to whatever hormones that are being expressed, adrenaline, cortisol, whatever it is, I do those things I know that reduce them. Yeah. You know, I often talk to people and I say, there's a huge difference between not having to prove fault to get divorced and that fault never matters. I think that is the most I understand why we did it because fault was such a difficult thing to prove. It was messy. There were private investigators, all of that stuff. But it is horrifying to be a person who ends up paying alimony to somebody that cheated on them. You know, yeah. and imagine how I, the, the, the court don't care. Now, there's marital misconduct now where you can, if, if, if his, his or her misconduct cause some financial uh the marriage to financial detriment you can you can use that in in, in allocating yeah, assets and whatnot it, but it does matter sometimes and and that, it that's does. something I do say because fault does matter uh, and and I do say that because you what I say is you don't have to prove fault to get a divorce but fault does matter at times and it matters for waste. And dissipating, yeah, dissipating assets. Yep. You know, and it matters in custody. It certainly matters in custody. Yes, it does. Uh, you know, it matters if you lie. It matters for, for, for perjury. It matters, if, you know, I mean, there are many times that it does certainly matter. Right. Now, um, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And that and, and what you said is far clearer than, than than the point I was making. So. So, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, so I, I want. I, I try to tell people that there's just a huge difference. And I think that this no fault thing, you know, meaning that fault never matters is kind of a myth in a way. Right, right. No, you don't have to have a reason to get divorced and you don't have to have a reason acceptable in court to get a divorce, but, but you have to behave yourself in a manner. And, yeah, and, the, and, and, and the court knows when you're not, if you don't sit down, Zora, I am so sorry. Oh, you're fine. And and the other thing is, I always say, and I want you to speak to this too, as a judge, that judges are people and they can see who people are and they get their certain opinions about who people are. You do. You do. And when you, when you can't obey my orders, like when you can't stop talking or when you try to, what really used to irritate me was they try to slant their testimony to outrage me and upset me. And I remember one time some dude, I think he was a cardiologist, wrote Molly sucks inward dick on her car. Oh. And the prosecutor kept saying it over and over again to outrage me. And I finally say, counsel approach. Well, I'll say it again. We heard it the first time. You don't have to keep saying it, but it's, you know, everybody wants to pull in everything wrong that everybody did. And I understand it to an extent, but you got to understand 
you know, marriage is about love, divorce is about business, and you got to conduct business in here with me. Mm, that's a good quote. I like that. Yeah. But uh, I, I will say one of the things that I've often said is kind of like the same reason that people get married is often the same reason that people get divorced, which is like they love. I often say that the husbands will say, oh, I love I love her. She's so crazy. Right. I, I hate her. She's so crazy. She's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what was appealing at 25? Yeah. At 45. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I love the fact that he takes control. Oh, I hate him. He's so controlling. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you're, you're looking at the same behavior, but, but from a different side of the lens. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, That's it's so like, true. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, as a divorce attorney, I kind of saw both sides of it. Right. But, uh, so I want to just ask you mm -hmm. from the, the place of transformation, because you are so dedicated to helping people and empowering people in their personal journeys. And that's something that you, it's really been a mission for you. Um, what would be the advice that you have, especially, I think, as far as seeking support and, um, and, and, you know, maybe from networks or, um, and helping people transform. Yeah. I tell you, I, um, as you know, my husband died not too long ago and I've always been a very solitary person. It's been me and him, me and him, me and him. We didn't eat nobody. I mean, sometimes we wouldn't let the kids in the house. I mean, it was just like, you know, <laughs> it's us, it's us, it's us. And I have girlfriends, but I never really spent any time. You know what I mean? And those girlfriends got me through it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the calls at 2 a.m., the hysteria, they never cared. One of them was suffering from leukemia. She didn't tell me mm -hmm. until I was at a place where I could hear that because my husband had just died. So support, I mean, even to a, 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 a I mean... J.D. Salinger level recluse is immeasurable. The importance of that decides whether there are days where you just don't perform and days where you can get out of bed because you couldn't always get out of bed, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and a lot of times, and some of them, I had different, different kinds of friends for different things. Mm -hmm. There was a girlfriend I call always make me laugh. Mm -hmm. You know, there's both of them will get mad with me. Got another girlfriend who's got whose life is messed up. So we talk about her messed up life. So support is invaluable. And you you have to make sure you're asking the right person for the right kind of support. Because there's some people, you know, there were some people I could not tell how much I was drinking. There were some people who I told exactly how much I was drinking so they could hold me account to it so it wouldn't get too bad. You know what I mean? But yeah, it, you've uh, got to have the right person for the right thing, because one person will help me stop. Another person will yell at me for doing it. Mm, so good. And I so appreciate your honesty and your vulnerability. You, you've always been so good with that. And it's so immensely and immeasurably helpful to the community. And I just really, really want to acknowledge Can I say something about that quickly? Yes. I got the most bizarre direct mail from somebody I went to high school with who told me that, she, that they were going to expose me as a fake and a fraud because of my fake, um, my fake Southern accent and I pretend like I'm from the ghetto. And she says, I know you didn't, not from the ghetto and that show judge me not, and you're a liar, and you're going to be exposed, and wait till all the kids, the people that you went to school tells everybody that you don't tell anybody the truth. Now, that person is unhappy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It got nothing to do with me. That person is unhappy because I've always been very if it happened, it happened. I did it, I did it. And I speak the way I speak. And what she didn't realize also 
is that Black people speak when we are amongst ourselves differently than we do out in the larger world. We mm -hmm. just do. So mm -hmm. when I would have Black litigants, my vernacular would change a bit. But I used to say, I used to arraign like 70 people in the morning. My vernacular changed person to person to person because you're not talking to a defendant. You're talking to Joe, Barbara, Ann, Felicia. And if you don't know who you're talking to, they won't understand what you're saying because you won't say it correctly. But I, I don't know. I just found that fascinating. She just posted it the other day. It was like, you're going to be exposed as a liar. And I'm like, hmm. You know Something what? Like that? Never justify, argue, defend, or explain. <laughs> I plead guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Rise above. You know what? Right, right. right. waves cannot uh, coexist with light waves. Right. There, there you go. There you <laughs> that go. is my mantra. I love that. I <laughs> love that. You know, some people are just oh, so that's you know. That's I was like, you know what I always think with people like that? I'm like, I never take a look at people that I would like want to diss or whatever and think, I'm going to get out my laptop and write them a note and send them a letter think, telling them how much I don't like them. I would yeah, if you ran into that. me, the store is one thing, but to take your time to post I would it. never even do that. I'm so busy with my own stuff. Like, I would never it, even take I, time I, to do that. That was just like, ha, huh, that is so interesting. And so I'm thinking, okay, so um, you must obviously think highly of me if you're going to spend the time to do that. I mean, a long post, you know, so I was like, I, I shared so it they and obviously we are in a Yeah, we have. Know? It was funny. Yeah. So, um, so what you know reflecting on your journey and you you've come so far and you've accomplished so much and you've really overcome so much in your life and it's so much struggle and so much um i, I mean really and you're in in some ways you really are um an inspiration to so many um what message would you have for people who are facing what might seem like insurmountable uh, pain or conflict right now? I do a few things. I think music is, is, is a great brain changer and I'm always playing to my emotions. So I have different playlists that start with however I feel. If I'm angry, I got an angry song and, that, that, that. and then song by song by song by song, I take myself into another mood. And at the end, it's always Anita Baker, you bring me joy. And I'm doing those second runs with her. So, you know, that that's one thing I do. I exercise because, again, that's endorphins. That's me fighting the fight without in, without engaging anybody anyway. I, I write down everything I can, I write through, even on my Instagram posts, I start with the feeling and I write through until I can work it out. You know, I may start out upset, but I end out, end up calm because I don't take my emotional life for granted. I work on it just like I work on it harder than I worked on being a lawyer. I mean, I work on it and you, if you work and then I have joys during the day that I demand that I do. I have a little crochet needle near everything in case, you know, so I never have a mind that wanders and gets bored. Um, I, 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 uh, I, you know, I have the right people to call at the right time for, 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 for the right need. And um, it's a, uh, it's always a, it, the, the battle I fight is always with me so that when I show up with the rest of the world, I'm pretty, I'm in good shape. I mean, not that I'm glacial. I got some friends that are glacial and I do call one of them, Kay, glacial. I call her, she's like, okay, Lynn, here we go. You know, but the fight I got to fight is with me. If I come correct, because you can't think as well when you're upset. 
When you're mad, your brain don't function as well. You, 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 you miss stuff. You go off on tangents. You can't see a good exit path. You can't say, I'm sorry. I Listen, I will apologize in a minute. If you know what? I was wrong. I apologize. I'm so sorry. Mm -mm -mm. Because I'm not wasting my time arguing. I, it doesn't, uh, I don't, I don't want to be right. I want to be right with the emphasis on the object and not the subject. Yeah. Or like you want your head on straight. Hey. Right. <laughs> yeah. I just don't want to end the argument win the argument. I want to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh. So this has been just absolute gems every minute of the second of the entire time as per the usual. And so more to come for for you guys. And we've been talking about how we're going to serve you more and more and more. And so we're excited about that. So thank you again, Judge Lindholler. You are just absolutely incredible. Just adore you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so you. much for having me. I enjoyed it. I'm sorry that Zora acted up, but <laughs> we did the best we could. Ah, you were fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great day.